All right, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to think in your mind a person who you look at their life and you're like, man, they have got it all together, okay? Like when you look at their life, their life is, is perfect. Uh, they've got like the greatest job and they make really good money and you look at their marriage and it seems like their marriage has no flaws and their kids are incredibly intelligent and athletic. Uh, they throw the best parties, they drive the, the best cars, they go on these greatest vacations, okay? I want you to think in your mind who that person is, all right? So, so think about that person, put that in your mind, hold on to that just for a second. Uh, it's fall and uh, football season is here. And some of you, I know you gamble on football games, all right? We're just going to go ahead and put that out there. You know who you are. We're not going to call you out, but you do that. And maybe use the app FanDuel, okay? Maybe that's what you use. So here's the deal. I'm going to give you a winner today, all right? I'm going to give you a 100% winner because here's the deal. When I told you to think about this one person that, that you would look at and you would look at their life and you would think, man, they have the perfect life. Here's what you did, okay? The person that you thought about, this is 100%, 100% on this winner, wasn't you, Right? When I said, hey, think about this perfect person who's got all these perfect things in their life, and you look at them, you're like, man, I wish I could kind of have that life or live that life. The person that came to your mind was not you. You thought about someone else. But the question is, why do we do that? Well, the reality is we have these things that are called expectations, okay? And, and expectations affect how we see life and how we, how we view ourselves, and so we go through life, living our life a certain way based on these expectations. So, so the way that we look and the cars that we drive and the things that we have and the jobs that we get, I mean, all of these things so often are based on these expectations that we put on ourselves or that others put on us. And so there's, there's almost this, this pressure that we have to live our life a certain way. And so day to day, we're trying to live up to these expectations. But there's another piece to this. You're here in this church, there's probably a part of you that's trying to follow Jesus the best you can, okay? And so not only do we have these day-to-day -day expectations to live sort of this perfect life, but, but then we feel like we've got this pressure when it comes to our faith. We, we read these words from Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Jesus says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. No pressure there, right? No, I mean, when it comes to religion, when it comes to faith, there's these expectations to, to kind of be this perfect Christian, that, that you're spending two hours a day in prayer, that you're reading the Bible three hours a day, that when you sit down to dinner with your family, you can exegete the book of Revelation in that time period. I mean, this is kind of the way we think about it, right? But because we have these expectations that are sort of thrust on us, and not only our day-to-day -day life, but there's this pressure there to follow Jesus. Well, what happens? when we put all these expectations together well no matter what we do no matter who we are we feel like we can never win but how do we deal with it instead of trying to figure out how to work through that we go through life playing a game and, and the game is my life is great that, that everything I do and everything I have it's wonderful it's perfect look at this perfect family I've got a perfect marriage my dating relationships are perfect my kids are perfect I've got this perfect life and so outwardly, we go through life trying to give this impression that everything in our life is perfect. But inwardly, we struggle. Inwardly, we never feel worthy. And in fact, the reality is, deep down inside, we're messy and maybe even broken. And so today, we continue our series called Chasing Carrots. And the big question that we've been asking in this series is, what are you chasing? Because all of us are chasing after something. Are we chasing things that matter or are we chasing things that don't? And so over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about chasing comfort and we've been talking about chasing success. And this morning, we're going to talk about chasing perfection. Because I believe if every single one of us was honest with each other, with ourselves, we would realize we're all chasing perfection in some way. But again, it goes back to the question, are we chasing things that matter or are we chasing things that don't? Well, if we're going to talk about expectations and we're going to talk about perfection, then we should probably understand where this comes from. And there are actually these different categories of perfectionists, all right? And more than likely, you probably fall under one of these categories. Now, I'm going to share three with you because I believe these are the three main ones that, that we kind of fall into. Now, there are a couple of more, but I just want to share these first three or these these three because I, I believe again 
you and I, we probably fall into one of these categories. Here's the first one. The first one is self-oriented perfectionist. If this is you, you are a person who has high expectations for yourself. Like you almost have these impossible standards that you have put up there for yourself. You, you set big goals. And your job in life is to reach these big, huge goals that you have. And nothing will stop you from reaching those goals. Now, we call that being motivated. We call that being goal-oriented. But you're the type of person, if you don't reach those expectations, you really battle these feelings of, of guilt and, and in shame. Because you're a person that tends to obsess about your work. That, that if you're not working as hard as you think you can, if you're not reaching those goals, then you're being inefficient, that you're inadequate in who you are. And, and so you really struggle with this idea of failure. But that's where some of us are. Some of us are these self-oriented perfectionists. Others fall into this next category, externally oriented perfectionists. If this is you, you believe others have impossible expectations of you. That other people expect you to be perfect. That you must succeed in everything you do. That you must accomplish more than anybody else. We find this a lot in family relationships. Where parents, we will push our kids to succeed, to accomplish beyond any standards that are out there. Now, now what happens when this is the case? What happens if we are uh, a part of this category? Well, this pressure that we feel from others affects us pretty deeply. We tend to feel alone. Uh, we tend to be depressed. We tend to feel desperate. Because in our minds, when we're in this category, no matter how hard you work, you'll never be good enough. And so maybe some of us fall into the externally oriented perfectionist category. And then the last category is the other oriented perfectionist. And this is where you impose your expectations on someone else. Uh, that you create these impossible expectations for someone else to live up to. And so you don't like being around people who won't strive to be better. You don't like being around people who are close to you who make mistakes. And so if you ask someone to do something, your expectation is it will be done flawlessly. Well, what's the problem we find here? Well, the problem we find here is that that person's relationships tend to be a mess. And the reason is pretty simple, because you're always criticizing the actions of others. You, you've got these high standards for others that, that in the end, those standards are actually more important to you than the relationship that's there. And that makes for really messy relationships. And so for some of us, we fall into that category of that other-oriented perfectionist. Now, like I said, I'm guessing that most of us fall into one of these three areas if we were honest in ourselves. But, but really the question is, why are we this way? Why do we have this, this chase for perfection in our life? Well, I think this chasing perfection comes from the fears that we carry. We, we fear rejection. Uh, we fear being judged. We fear failure. And when we have these fears in our life, there are these deep insecurities that we carry, these feelings of inadequacy. And, and many of us will carry shame, will carry guilt uh, because of, of the failures and the mistakes that we've seen in ourselves and we see in other people. We, we struggle with this. And so we chase for perfection. But here's the deal. In our minds, chasing perfection is something that we can control. Because I can control my performance. I can control my effort. I can control my, my work. And so I'm going to put incredible pressure on myself to reach these expectations. Or I'm going to expect others to reach these expectations. And I'm going to put this pressure on them. Because in the end, we want to think, we want to feel like we are living this this perfect life. And the only way to do that is if we reach these expectations in our life. But here's the deal. If we were really to dig deep into this idea of chasing perfection, what we would find is that this is really a spiritual issue. That this is a spiritual, spiritual issue that we struggle with. We, we see Jesus' words back there in Matthew and about being perfect as, as God is perfect. And, and we think about that by looking at our life and we see our mistakes and, and we see where we mess up and we, we see our sin and we think to ourselves, I can't be this person that God wants me to be. There's like these unrealistic expectations God has on me. 
or you're part of a church and whoever's speaking up here, you feel like, man, you're, you're putting these impossible expectations and standards for, for me to follow. And, and if I can't do that, well, then maybe in the end, I really don't have time to follow God. Maybe in the end, God's not the most important thing in my life. And I believe this is the point where many people walk away from their faith. Uh, they walk away from the church. And they walk away from God. Now, I want to stop right there and just say this for a second. I've shared this before. I want you to know that if that is you, being here at the journey is the perfect place for you. Okay? Because we are a group of imperfect people here. And like I like to say it, who are serving a perfect God. Like our leaders are imperfect, our volunteers are imperfect, you're imperfect, I'm imperfect, we're all imperfect. We're imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And so we want you to know this is a safe place for you to bring your imperfections and, and to hopefully work through what that looks like for you and that relationship and that connection to God. Because we're not about perfection here, we're about figuring out what it looks like for us to take those next steps with Jesus in our life. But we have to deal with those expectations. We have to deal with this feeling of perfection that we think we need. So how do we do that? Well, I want to take you to a, an event that takes place in Jesus' life. It's a conversation he has with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. We find it in Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Here's what it says. At about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested, Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Let me give you a little context here about the Pharisees. Um, they are the religious leaders at the time, and their job was to help people follow the religious laws that were in place. Now, when this thing all kind of started, it really was just these Ten Commandments, okay? So God gives these Ten Commandments to Moses. He's like, Hey, Moses, here's Ten Commandments. Tell the people to follow these Ten Commandments. And so Moses takes them down, like, hey, we've got to follow these Ten Commandments. And everybody's like, okay, that sounds great. Well, the religious leaders looked at those Ten Commandments, and they spent a lot of time looking at them. As they looked at them, they were like, you know, God, hey, thanks. I mean, <laughs> you did a really good job. You know, we just want to tell you that first. We want to encourage you a little bit. You know, this is the second version because, you know, they kind of broke the first one. Moses got mad and broke it. But we know this is the second version. Maybe you didn't have enough time to put into it. And so they looked at those Ten Commandments, and they said, we're, we're just going to add a few things to it, all right? And so over time, they actually added 613 laws that the Jewish people were supposed to follow. And that's over and beyond those Ten Commandments. It didn't end there, though. Because depending on where you live, depending on the synagogue you were part of, depending on the rabbi you followed, you could have up to 2,000 laws and rules in place for you to follow. That was not the intention from the very beginning. Because God's like, here's 10, right? These work. If you follow these 10, and you do your best to follow these 10, you're going to get close to me. We're, we're going to have this pretty good relationship, you and I. And if you really look at those 10 commandments, they're pretty good. Like, I mean, if we actually lived by those 10 commandments, we'd be in pretty good shape. But the religious leader said, no. They're not perfect enough. Like the expectations that are there, they're, they're not good enough. And so these religious leaders start throwing in all of these other expectations. Now they took the Ten Commandments and these other rules and laws, they attached them to the Ten Commandments that were there. So for the Pharisees, it was like, you should be perfect. Like if you want to have this connection to God, you want to have this relationship with God, you actually just can't do it on your own. Here's what you got to do. You got to live this perfect life. And so these Jewish people lived under this incredible religious oppression. Because when they messed up, the Pharisees were there to say, well, you messed up. Oh, that's, that's going to come off your list right there. I mean, you, you're not going to be able to connect with God. They were, they were kind of holding it out there. Like, if you're not perfect, you can never have this relationship with God. And God's like, that's not how I actually set this thing up. So I jumped in and changed all that. And so we have this, this event here where Jesus is walking through the grain field with his disciples. They're, they're hungry. It's a Sabbath. And, and they, they just pick a few pieces of kernel there, grain, and, and they eat it. Now, truthfully, that wasn't illegal. That, that wasn't anything that they weren't supposed to do. However, for the Pharisees, 
they looked at the Sabbath commandment and they had added all these different ideas to the Sabbath commandment. One of them was you can't harvest grain on the Sabbath day. And so if you picked a kernel of grain, they considered that harvesting grain. I mean, this was the point that it had gotten to. And so Jesus is like, they're not doing anything illegal here. In fact, here's what Jesus says to them in verse 3. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went to the house of God and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? And so here's what Jesus does. He goes back to their history class. He's like, hey guys, you know King David. You're familiar with Moses. Hey, these are your forefathers. This is a big part of the Jewish faith. Hey, guess what? They messed up sometimes too. And you know what else? They weren't perfect. Then Jesus continues on. He says, I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Look at that last statement there, right before that last statement. Jesus says, I want you to show mercy, not sacrifice. What he's connecting here to is this idea of perfection and, and actually following and connecting with God. He's, he's talking about the sacrificial piece, and that very much was a part of the Jewish faith. That was very much a part of, of trying to live this perfect life. And, and here is Jesus who's like, it's not about this idea of these rules and perfection. He says it's pointing us to mercy, that there's something bigger at play here, that we should be focused on mercy and not this idea of perfection. And yet you have the Jewish people who are struggling with this. They're afraid to fail. They're afraid to mess up. They're afraid to make mistakes. And the religious people are like, we're just going to keep pushing them to live this perfect life. And yet right here, Jesus says it's not about perfection. It's about showing mercy. It's about being compassionate towards people. It's about loving others unconditionally. Because I believe Jesus doesn't call us to perfection. Jesus calls us to this unconditional love. Which actually takes us back to Matthew. If we go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, I want to read that again. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, we read that in that context, just like it is right now. We think to ourselves, I can't do that. Like, I can't be that perfect. If, if I make a mistake, if I sin, then I guess I'm not good enough for God. And we just kind of move on. But that's one of the reasons we should never just read a verse like that on its own. Because it says a lot without saying a lot, all right? So we need to read this in context. So let's actually go back to verse 43. <clears throat> Here's what Jesus says. <clears throat> you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives us sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here's Jesus who's saying it's not about the rules. It's not about being perfect in our actions, in our performance. He's saying it's about being perfect in how we love. Because look at what he references here. He says, you can't love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You can't do both of those things. He says, you can't only love those who love you. He's like, even the corrupt people love people, but, but you're supposed to have this different kind of, of love. He says, you can't only be friendly with your friends. People far from God do that. Again, he's like, the kind of love that you've got to have is so different than the love the world has. And so the question is, how do we love the world we live in? This perfection Jesus is talking about is this perfection in how we love. That there aren't certain standards or expectations, and if you reach these standards or expectations, then I will love you. He said, no, we're supposed to have this unconditional love. The unconditional love that God has for us is the same love we're supposed to have for the world we live in. 
So it begs that question, are we fully loving others? Which means are we fully loving others no matter who they are? No matter what they've done to us, no matter how they feel, uh, or we feel about them, no matter the things they, they may believe that may be different than us, are, are we fully loving others in that way? Because perfection says, if you don't conform to my expectations, then I won't care about you. I won't show you any love. Perfection says internally that if I can't perform up to my own expectations, then I'm not worth anything. I'm not worth loving myself. But God's not interested in our perfection. God's interested in this unconditional love. In fact, if we go back to verse 48 there, the Greek word that's used for perfect, it's not about performance. It actually means to be mature. To be mature in our love. Uh, our son is an eighth grader at Irving Middle School. And, um, and so, you know, being a dad of a, a boy, talk about gym class, because I remember what gym class was like, and some of you think back that far, you remember what gym class was like, and, you know, they're in the stage this year, last year they didn't make them change because of COVID, this year they got to put on their, their gym uniforms and stuff, and so we're kidding around, you know, playing around all this all the time, and I'm like, hey, dude, I was like, so when you guys are getting changed, like, are there boys there that have hair all over their chest and hair in their armpits, and he starts laughing, he's like, oh, yeah, dad, I mean, yeah, it's kind of crazy, and like, some of them even have beards, it's like, it's like there's a 35-year-old man in gym class with me, and I guess that, that could be possible if you didn't, didn't pass your, your grades. But, um, but he's like, it's just so weird, it's so different. Well, we think about teenagers for a second, when we hopefully remember those days if we're not there right now, and we go through this maturation process, right? We're, we're, we're kids at one point, but then we begin to mature, and, and hormones hit, and we change. And, and again, speaking from a guy's perspective, your voice gets deeper, your body gets hairier, you start to notice these things called girls. And the reason this is, is because we're maturing in who we are. Hopefully to someday to be mature as an adult. Well, as Jesus talks about this word perfect here, he's talking about being mature in who we are when it comes to loving others. That we're mature in this love without limitations towards other people. That we don't carry these expectations of perfection and performance from other people, but, but we love them fully. We, we love them maturely. We, we love them with, with this complete love in who we are. Jesus says, don't worry about your perfection. Don't, don't worry about trying to be perfect like the world wants you to be perfect. Don't, don't worry about trying to be perfect in the way that you think that you should be perfect. Your goal in life, our goal in life, is not to convince other people that our life is together. Our goal in life isn't to show people that, hey, I've lived up to these expectations and I, I've got this perfect life going on. That's not our, our goal in life. Our goal in life is to show people how great God is. That even in our own imperfections, that we understand that if we're following Jesus, there's a God who fully loves us. And because this God fully loves us, our job is then to go out and to fully love others. There, there are no conditions to this love. That mercy and, and compassion and, and that unconditional love is there in us. I, I think about it this way, um, kids learning to walk, right? And uh, if you've ever had a kid learn to walk or you've been around a kid learning to walk, you know that when they first get started, they, they always hold on to something. Now, there's always that one parent that'll come up to me if I ever talk about this sort of thing, like my kid didn't hold on to anything. My kid like started running, like the very first step they were just running and I'm pretty much sure they're lying to me. But sometimes you, you get that response from people. In most cases, your kid isn't that talented. Um, and so they, they hold on to stuff, right? And, and they hold on to stuff and they get themselves up and they kind of hold on to it as they try to walk. But nevertheless, they're going to fall. And, and, and when they fall, what is our response as a parent? Do, do we look at the kid that's on the ground, maybe he got some tears, and like, well, you're pathetic. <laughs> I mean, I really thought I was going to get a more coordinated kid. Uh, I mean, you can't even walk. You can't even take a step. You're not going to be anything in your life because you can't do this right now. That's not how we respond, is it? What do we do? The, the kid falls, and, and we go over to the kid, and we help the kid up. We, we, we hug the kid, maybe give him a kiss on the forehead. Uh, we give them some encouraging words. And, 
And, and, and if you're a really good parent, you, you put your finger down, like, hey, hold on to my finger, and you hold on to their hand, and you help them take those steps. That's what mature love is. That, that's what it looks like to understand mercy and compassion. And sometimes we have to think about it in the, the realm of, of that child that we are helping up to take those next steps in their life. It's not about performance. It's not about perfection. It's about this unconditional love that we have for this kid, even even when they fail. Here's the deal. You and I are going to fall short in our life. We're, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up. We're going to sin. And thankfully, God's not like, you know what? You're worthless. Like, I got no time for you. You are pathetic. You can't meet these expectations. You're not perfect. And so I'm going to go hang out with these people who got their life together. Now, some of us think that's the case when it comes to God, and some of that comes from things we read, and some of it comes from things we've been taught, and we think that's how God views us. And when we think God views us in that way, we carry a lot of shame. We carry a lot of guilt deep down. But here's the way God loves us. God loves us in such a way that there's not enough bad we can do in our life where God still doesn't love us. That, that we can make mistakes consistently. We, we can sin every day like we do, and God is not going to give up on us. Now, we may give up on God because of these ideas of, of perfection that we've been, we've been taught or we feel or we think ourselves. But God's full of incredible grace and mercy and this incredible unconditional love. So for God, it's not about being perfect. It's about this mature, complete full love that God has for all of us. That word perfect that we find in Matthew 5, it's actually the same root word that Jesus uses when he's on the cross. And again, it's this idea of maturity. And so when, when Jesus says it is finished, that word finished there means it's complete. It's whole. It's done. It's fully matured. That even in your imperfection, there is a God who fully loves you, and you understand that, and then you are able to love the world in the same way. So now go fully love others. But again, sometimes that's hard for us to understand in this world where we're chasing perfection. Uh, an example of this is if you think about kids who are learning to walk, Usually when they start, they pull themselves up and they hold on to something because they're, they're very unsteady, but, but they're trying to take that, that first step. But when that kid falls, because that kid's going to fall, you're going to be like, dude, my kid, first time, just stood right up, started doing sprints. You're lying, all right? That doesn't really happen. There's always that one parent thinks their kid's amazing. But 99-point uh, kid falls, okay? And, and when your kid falls, you look at your kid and you're like, you're pathetic, how did I get the most uncoordinated kid? Why can't you walk? I mean, you've got two legs. Why can't you just take those steps? That's not how we respond, is it? How do we respond? We see the child, we watch them fall, we go over and we pick them up. We help them up. We, we give them a hug. We give them a kiss on the forehead. We, uh, we encourage them. Or better yet, we're like, hey, hold, hold my finger and, and let me help you walk. That's what unconditional love looks like. That's what mature love looks like because we understand that. We're not going to yell at our kid because they couldn't take that first step. No, we love them unconditionally. So we're going to do everything we can to help them along. It's not about perfection or performance or perfection. It's about this unconditional love, even in those moments of failure. Because here's the deal. You and I, we're going to fall short. We're going to make mistakes, we're going to mess up, we're going to sin. And God doesn't say in those moments, well, you're pathetic, you're worthless, I don't have any time for you, you're not perfect, I'm going to go over to hear this other person who's following all the rules and living up to all these expectations that have been put on them. And yet this is the way we think, many of us think that God works just because we haven't really thought through how God works, or we've been taught to think that this is how God works and how God views us. And so when we go through life in that way, we carry this incredible amount of guilt and shame 
deep down inside of us. But here's what I know about God. No matter how bad we are, no matter how many mistakes we make, no, no matter how much we, we sin, God will not give up on us. Now, sadly, some of us may give up on God. But God is full of mercy and grace and compassion and this unconditional love. Because for God, it's not about performance. And yet, some of us that are followers of Christ, man, we, we've got this idea it's all about performance when it comes to following God. That it's not about performance. It's not about being perfect. Again, it goes back to being full of mercy and this unconditional, mature love God has for us. How do we know this? If we go back to that word perfect in Matthew 5, it's the same root word that Jesus actually uses on the cross when he says it is finished. And so when Jesus uses that word finished there, here's what he means. He means it's matured. It is complete. It's whole. It's done. And so the cross here is this example of complete love that God has for us. The cross is a reminder of that mercy and that grace and that compassion and again, that unconditional love that God has for each one of us. And what's asked of us is then to reflect that love into the world we live in. That we're not putting these incredible expectations on others to live this life of perfection. That we're not even asking ourselves to live this life of perfection. What we are called to do is to live a life that is full of love. We don't have to go through life living under these, these high expectations of perfection or throwing them out on other people or, again, internally ourselves because our life is not about perfection. It's about growing in this perfect love for God. And here's the deal. Let's say you follow all the rules and you do all the things and you're living up to all these expectations. Guess what? God's not going to love you more because of that because maybe you are living a really good life following Jesus. God's not going to love you more than someone else. And maybe you're on the other spectrum and, and you're like, hey, I mean, I make a lot of mistakes and, and sin's a part of my life and I'm trying to do better. God's not going to love you less because you're not perfect or you're not, not in this place where you're, you've really gotten to fully follow Jesus. God says, hey, I, I love you no matter who you are. I, I love you unconditionally. I, I love you with my mercy and compassion and, and this incredible, incredible grace. And here's the deal. My expectation of you is to now live that exact same way in this world. To show the world the kind of love I have for you and to love the world in the same manner. But when you and I are chasing perfection, it leaves us empty. It leaves us depressed. We feel inadequate. We carry guilt and shame, feelings of, of rejection. But chasing after Jesus and living this life that's full of this unconditional love, it leaves us where we have this maturity in our faith. That, that we know no matter what, there's a God who loves us fully. And we know no matter what, that we are called as followers of Christ to love others fully ourselves. But the question you and I have to wrestle with, and I think every single one of us wrestle with this today, are we here to chase after perfection? Or are we here to chase after Jesus?